Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 41st Annual Science and Engineering Fair hosted by The Most. Uh, we wish we could have you all here uh, in person this year, and hopefully we can do that next year, but we are still so thrilled with the great turnout from our science fair participants this year. Students, you did an extraordinary job, especially given the circumstances this year, and I commend you for your incredible projects. Thank you all for being here today. And now we are on to the award ceremony. Welcome, and to many of you, welcome back to the 41st Central New York Science and Engineering Fair. Because science, because our founding fathers saw fit to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. In the Intellectual Property Clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, United States Constitution. Because one can see further if one stands on the shoulders of giants. Sir Isaac Newton. Because Research is to see what everybody else has seen, but to think what nobody else has thought. Albert Sent Gurji. Because science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated. Rosalind Franklin. Because the good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Because maybe there is a more effective and efficient way to track the orbiting satellite carrying amateur radio Oscar. Because maybe cell phones and headphones emit more radiation than we think they do. Because maybe a behavioral science-based analysis can influence opioid, opioid prescribing patterns to lessen the opioid crisis. Because science, because you, you are the students of science. You are scientists. You are where science happens and science happens where you are. Yes. Absolutely yes, science happens. It happens in your backyards, in your homes, in your schools, in your labs, in the air, and in the skies. You cannot ignore science, and science will not be ignored. Science happens around you, for you, to you. Science happens in systems, and scientific discovery happens through systems. Scientific research develops not just through an individual scientist, but with a team of collaborators and supporters. You have that structure throughout Central New York and right here at the most. Let's acknowledge and thank our local community that inspires and supports your science. To the parents, caregivers, teachers, and the mentors of our participants, we thank you for patiently guiding, loudly encouraging, and cleaning up after scientific discovery. To the financial supporters, we thank you for ensuring the existence of today's showcase for student scientific research. To the senior division, junior division, and special awards judges. We thank you for your expertise, time, constructive criticism, and flexibility in giving of yourselves for the betterment of our students, our future. To the most Central New York Science and Engineering Fair Committee, who through ingenuity and countless hours of planning made this 41st CNYSEF into a virtual reality. Simply put, the Central New York Science and Engineering Fair does not happen without you. Let's personally thank Greg Wellich, who orchestrated the technology and processes 
to bring the CNY SEF successfully into the ether. Kevin Lucas, who built our data backbone and made our light bright in all the right places. Chris Perrine, who structures the CNY SEF and keeps us grounded, literally. Stephanie Herbert, who made CNY SEF look professional in printed and social media and gets our very important message out to everyone who needs to hear it. Dr. Emily Stewart, who spearheaded and choreographed every component of our virtual fair. We are especially grateful for her efforts, relentless attention to detail, and exemplary leadership. With Dr. Stewart on the team, we can do this. No great science fair happens without a great science fair director. We thank Dr. Peter Plumley, our science fair director, who since 2008 has worked passionately, creatively, and tirelessly to transform and build our fair into a local stronghold for student research exhibition. Because of Professor Plumley's vision and tenacity, our fair has become a cornerstone of Central New York and is recognized and competitive both statewide and nationally. I am privileged and honored to introduce this year's keynote speaker, Dr. Nathan Lentz. Dr. Lentz earned his bachelor's degree in biology from St. Louis University, his PhD in pharmacology and physiology from St. Louis University, and completed his postdoctoral fellowship in genomics at New York University. Dr. Lentz is a professor of biology at John Jay College, the City University of New York. He is the author of Not So Different, Finding Human Nature in Animals, and Human Errors, A Panorama of Our Glitches, From Pointless Bones to Broken Genes. He hosts a podcast entitled The World of Humans. Those of you who have read his blogs and listen to his talks already know that he is as much of an accomplished scientist as an engaging entertainer. Let's warmly and graciously welcome Dr. Lentz to Central New York, to the most, and to the Central New York Science and Engineering Fair. I give you Dr. Nathan Lentz. Okay, well, thanks very much for that kind introduction. Um, and I appreciate uh, the invitation to be here with you. Um, I really wish um, that it were in person, that I could see all of your projects up close and I could uh, ask you questions and interact with you. Um, uh, mentoring young students in science and science research is one of my favorite things to do. My laboratory is always buzzing with uh, young students, uh, undergraduates and graduate students who are um, just getting their start, much like you. And um, I think the best research comes young minds who are serious and whose minds haven't been too hardened by their um, by their own thoughts and ideas but rather uh, by the questions um, the the bright eyes and, and bushy tails of, of young people have always been a key component of scientific research uh, because there's no substitute for raw curiosity uh, and exploration and that's how we discover new things is by not being too wedded to our own thinking and rather uh, uh, keeping an open mind uh, in our exploration. Um, so congratulations on all of your projects. I, uh, I, I looked through the list of them and I, I saw some of them myself and I think uh, it, it, they're wonderful and it's, it's a delight to be here with you. Uh, hopefully I'll get to meet some of you. Uh, there's a, a plan for me to come up to the museum and give a presentation as well. So I, and I hope I can do that uh, when, when conditions allow. So I'm now going to give you my presentation, which is uh, a bit of my own work um, and, and that I've written about in a book called Human Errors, which, um, uh, and I'm going to show the screen now, and hopefully uh, this all works without too much trouble. Um, and then if I put that onto full screen, I think it looks the best. And I think, I believe that you'll still be able to see me. Uh, while I'm talking to you, so that's great. Um, so what, what, what I what I want to talk to you about is what I call human errors. These are little quirks and glitches in our bodies, uh, our brains, even our minds, um, that um, are interesting and curious 
and that call out for an explanation. But the reason why I think they're worth exploring, why they're a topic um, uh, to explore is that they teach us a lot. Uh, my mother, once when she found out I was writing a book like this, was like, why do you want to write a book about everything that's wrong with the human body? That doesn't sound very fun. That sounds depressing. Um, and actually, it's anything but depressing. It's actually quite uplifting to think about all of our imperfections. Um, and I'll get to why it is so uplifting soon enough. Um, but the point is that each one of uh, these quirks and glitches that I, that I talk about in my book have a really interesting backstory. They actually reveal a lot about our past, our evolutionary past. Um, and when we think about studying human evolution and the, our evolutionary past, you often think about fossils. And uh, that's a great way to study study our past. I actually study the human genome myself. And that's another way uh, that to study the past. Actually, the marks of our, our long evolutionary past uh, are still with us in our DNA. And that's one of the things my laboratory studies. But actually, we can learn a lot about how we used to live by studying our bodies right now as they are, um, because the, the echoes of our past lives are really found in our bones and our muscles and our tissues. Uh, and when we explore them that way and we look at our body as a product of our evolutionary past, um, not only you know, reveals why we are the way we are, it can actually help us live in better harmony with our bodies. Uh, and when we understand how it was shaped, we can actually stop working against our natural biology and work rather in harmony or in concert with our natural biology. So I believe there's a lot to be gained. Uh, it's a happy story to think about all the, the shortcomings of our body because um, it, it, figures, it helps us figure out a way to, to overcome them, to live in, in better harmony uh, with our body. Um, and I've often thought of, of, um, of the the process of, of dissecting the human body for imperfection teaches us a whole bunch of things about biology. I think it's really, um, it's, it could, you can almost teach biology all throughout uh, with this uh, lens on imperfection. And um, there's really a few misconceptions that, um, there, there's three big misconceptions that my book pushes back against um, and helps us illuminate. One of them is that we have this tendency to think that organisms are perfectly adapted for their environment. Uh, and that's really just not the case. Organisms are not perfectly adapted. There's no such thing as perfection in nature. Um, organisms have sort of evolved to be just good enough, just good enough to survive and get their meals and pass on their genes to the next generation. Um, there's a lot of, of imperfections and imprecision uh, and inefficiency out there in nature. Now, I think if, if you were taking a multiple choice test, um, you would probably get this answer correct. No organisms are not perfectly adapted, but we have it as a bias in our mind to expect to see organisms that are sort of perfectly suited for what they do. Um, and instead, what we see in nature when we study closely is a whole lot of inefficiency, a lot, whole lot of creatures um, that have some, some real glaring flaws in how they work. Another lesson that, that our imperfections teach us, and this is a misconception that I push back, is that humans are uh, uh, special. So humans are the pinnacle of creation or, or the highest level of evolution. And that uh, the process of evolution on Earth has been this steady march of increasing perfection or increasing sophistication until we reach human beings. Uh, and that's not the case either, actually. Humans have uh, a whole lot of flaws and imperfections and inefficiencies. In fact, I argue in my book um, that humans are in many ways the most flawed. We actually see more mistakes and glitches and limitations in our biology than we do in other animals. Um, and I'll explain why that is uh, soon enough. But I, I, I argue that humans are actually probably the most flawed when it comes to our bodies, uh, at least of any mammal uh, alive today. And, um, and, and there's a happy reason why that's the case. Another, um, another lesson that human flaws teach us is the limits of evolutionary mechanisms. I mean, evolution isn't magic. It, it can't form whole new structures out of whole cloth. It's actually a very limited process. It can work with the body as it is now and make the tiniest tweaks and tugs, uh, hoping for some kind of advantage uh, in, with those tweaks and tugs. And um, with those limitations and those constraints come about a lot of compromises, a lot of trade-offs, a lot of, uh, uh, of evolutionary innovation comes at certain costs. Uh, one example I always use is if you look at vertebrates, uh, the wings have been invented three different times in vertebrate evolution. You have the birds, you have the flying mammals, uh, most notably the bats, um, and then you also have the pterosaurs, which are, of course, long, long since extinct. But those are the three times that vertebrates have invented wings. 
And all three times they lost their forelimbs. They lost all of the functions they, they could have done with their arms in order to transform their arms into wings. Wouldn't it have been nice? Wouldn't it have been nice to keep the forelimbs and then just grow new wings out of their back? Right. Uh, and that way they wouldn't have lost anything. But that's not how evolution works. There's simply no mechanism uh, for creating a whole new structure uh, because there would be no advantage to that structure until it was fully formed. Uh, and that's not how evolution works. It has to slowly tweak something. Uh, so every gain comes with a loss. And I think that human errors, many of those examples sort of teach that process, compromise and trade offs. And um, also, it gives us insights into our ancestral past about how our ancestors lived uh, and how they were shaped by the environment in which they lived. Uh, this is sometimes called the, the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, uh, meaning the way that human beings lived for hundreds of thousands of years, if not a couple million years, um, really has left its imprint on our bodies. And we are now living in very different ways than our ancestors did. And some of those ways actually go against our natural biology. And I'll get to some examples of that soon enough. In fact, I think probably you're all itching uh, for an example. Uh, so just hold on. I'm, I'm almost there. Um, in, the, um, in the book, I don't organize the chapters this way, but there's really sort of three categories of errors, three ways that we get uh, errors in our, in our physiology. One of them is just simply mismatch. So I talked, I mentioned this before, but we are living in very different ways than our ancestors did. And some of those differences in our environment now versus the environment we were shaped in um, uh, puts us at odds with our own bodies, for example. And, and just really simple example, how many of you are sitting in a chair right now? Uh, well, that's, that's good. that creates problems in our body because we were not evolved to sit in chairs. Chairs were not part of our ancestral past. Our ancestors spent very little time in the posture that we call sitting. Uh, they did, you know, they stood, they laid, they leaned. Uh, they squatted. They actually spent a lot more time squatting uh, than sitting, and we should spend more time squatting than sitting. Squatting is not particularly comfortable for us now, um, but sitting in chairs actually causes a lot of problems. In your, it, it makes for a very weak back. Uh, it's not great on our knees. You can actually get very tight hamstrings if you don't get out of that chair often enough. Um, and so chairs are, are not a great way to live your life. Uh, so I do what I can uh, to not sit in a chair as much as I can, whether it's a stand-up desk or, or other kind of, uh, just to get out of your chair periodically is a good thing. So, so one, one category of human errors that I talk about in the book are, are just simply mismatch. We also don't eat the same food that we used to eat, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we also have trade-offs. So when we, when we began to walk upright, for example, uh, we took anatomy that was very, very, fairly well adapted to walking on all fours and then transformed it into anatomy in which we stand upright. Well, there's going to be some trade-offs along the way. We can't just simply retool the body to create a bipedal creature from a quadrupedal one. There has to be some losses associated there. And I'm going to talk about what some of those were. Um, we also have just some examples of just pure bad luck. Things that happened in our evolutionary past that we, we lost functionality or, or misaligned some of our uh, adaptations. Uh, and there's simply no easy way to fix them. One very simple example of this is we lost the ability to make vitamin C for ourselves. And I'll talk about how that happened. That's one of the examples I will give you. Uh, most mammals make vitamin C purely in their livers, in their cells. They don't need it in their diet. You never have to make sure your dog gets enough uh, vitamin C, for example, citrus fruit. They make vitamin C for themselves. Most mammals do. But at one point in our past, we lost the ability to, to make our own vitamins. And um, this didn't give any benefits. We, the genes that are, that are responsible for it were inactivated by mutation. It didn't give any benefit. It wasn't a good thing. It wasn't a bad thing at the time because our ancestors were already eating food that was rich in vitamin C. However, this was a moment of bad luck because purely by chance, it got fixed in the population. So, and once it got fixed in the population, those genes continued to mutate beyond repair. We cannot fix the genes responsible uh, for making vitamin C, at least not easily, maybe through gene editing one day, but not through the evolutionary process. We'll never regain that ability anytime soon. Um, and so that's really had a lot of, uh, a lot of restrictions on where uh, primates, for example, can live. Primates cannot live in any environment in which vitamin C isn't readily available in that environment uh, through purely bad luck. And when they venture out of a vitamin C rich environment, they get scurvy. Uh, when they do so. So I'll come back to this example of scurvy and vitamin C uh, soon enough to show you how that happened and the negative effects it's had on our ancestors and even still today. 
Um, so in the book, I do organize uh, the, the errors that I talk about in two chapters. There's a chapter on anatomy, for example. And I'd like to begin with uh, an example. Uh, unfortunately, if you ever have read any reviews of my book online or, or um, anybody talking about my book online, pretty much, they all take their examples from the first chapter, which is the anatomy chapter. I hope it's not because they don't, they don't make it any further in the book. Uh, but, but I, I think, think those are the examples that jump out at people most of the anatomy chapters, which is, of course, why I put the chapter first. But I, I, I hope people continue to read uh, beyond that, <laughs> especially because I'm not an anatomist myself. Uh, so I think some of the best examples are, are uh, beyond that. Uh, anyway, um, so, uh, and that, oh, sorry, that, I didn't realize that wasn't up there. But so anatomy is the, sort of the first meaty chapter of the book. And I want to talk about a couple of the anatomical examples that I think will um, make some of these points uh, and why I think that they teach us a lot uh, about our evolutionary past. So I want to ask this question to the audience. I don't know how many people are, are live streaming, but usually if I get enough people in the room, I can get at least one person to answer yes to this question. Uh, have you ever had a cold? Has anyone in this room ever had a cold? Usually I can find at least one person who has a cold, who has had a cold. Obviously, I'm being ridiculous. We all get colds. Uh, the average American uh, gets three to four head colds a year. Um, and if you have children, that's more or like three or four hundred head colds a year is what it feels like. Um, and or, or if you're a teacher, for example, uh, so head colds are a common plague, almost always caused by a rhinovirus, but they can also be caused by adenoviruses or coronaviruses, uh, as we're now dealing with uh, one particularly uh, virulent strain of coronavirus. But there are lots of viruses that cause this. And um, and you might think this is just no way around this, but actually this is strictly a human problem. Have you noticed that your your dog and cat don't come down with the sniffles three or four times a year? They might occasionally get respiratory infections, but they're not very common. Even our livestock, which live in high population densities just like we do, they don't typically have this. Uh, certainly our ancestors or our, our closest relatives, the chimpanzees and gorillas, um, so they don't they don't have a problem of, of, of the common cold. So why is this a problem? Well. For one thing, of course, we live in high density now in a globalized population in which these things can spread and circulate. And by the time they come back around the globe, they've mutated and were subjected again. All of that's true. But that would be true of livestock, for example, and, and it doesn't happen. And uh, so, so there, we have some unique anatomical problems that lead us to get the common cold much more commonly than, um, than we would we, we'd get it otherwise. And I'm going to show you a picture of uh, of the human skull, uh, peeled back. I, I, we've, I, my, the artist that drew this for me uh, sort of peeled back the bone here and let you see what is known as the maxillary sinus cavity. Now, when you have sinus cavities in your forehead, the frontal sinus cavities, you have perinine and, and also paranasal uh, sinus cavities. So you have some smaller ones uh, around, behind, and underneath your nose. And then the biggest of all are the sinus cavities behind your cheekbones called the maxillary sinus cavities. Now, I'm going to tell you something controversial here, but I'm, I'm working on an article with some, with some physicians on this. The sinus cavities are vestigial structures that do almost no good for you, all right? You have all been taught what the sinus cavities do. They warm and humidify the air. Unfortunately, none of that's true. Um, what they do do is produce a lot of mucus that then drains and flows down our throat into our stomach. Uh, and they do do that, but they but that is a totally unnecessary function, and people who have had that function ablated in their skulls have no problems. Um, what the sinus cavities do is create a perfect environment for viruses and bacteria to infect us. And why is that the case? Well, so if you go very deep in the evolutionary past of mammals, most mammals actually have snouts, very long snouts. You can think of a dog or, or a wolf, but it, but look beyond that, even horses, cows, even kangaroos. If you go further enough back, most mammals actually have long snouts, uh, except primates. And the reason why is that most mammals navigate the world through their sense of smell. That's their best sense. That's the sense that they really have a heightened awareness of. The, 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 the sense of smell that your dog has is literally millions of times more sensitive and more nuanced and more detailed than your sense of smell. Uh, they haven't, they, they really do navigate. They, they recognize you, for example, not by how you look, but by how you smell. And they can recognize that uh, from very far away uh, and with, with great precision. So the sense of smell is really the mammalian way of, of, of navigating the world. And then along came primates. And primates, uh, through several adaptations, one including uh, uh, enhanced color vision, but really started to focus more, much more on vision. And to make their vision enhanced, we brought the eyes forward, away from the side of the eye. So think of most mammals have their eyes on the side, which gives them a nice wide field of vision. But what it doesn't do is give them good three-dimensional vision, because you want to have 
to feel the vision covered by two eyes in order to give you good depth perception. So we moved our eyes forward to give us that nice stereoscopic three-dimensional vision. But the problem when you bring the eyes forward is that the snout is in the way if you're a snouted animal. So in the evolution of primates, the snout regressed and, and back into the skull and the eyes came forward. And that represented a switch from how mammals navigate the world um, from away from the, the, the sense of smell or olfaction towards vision and a visual system. So primates are much more visually driven. We examine our world much more through our eyes than through our nose. Uh, that's all great, but evolution, being as sloppy and clumsy as it is, just sort of threw those big cavities up into our face because the cavities have a large, are large snout. The real function is to enhance the sense of smell, to give huge cavities where the air can come in and be concentrated with all these olfactory receptors sensing in the air. Well, we don't really need those anymore, but there was no easy way to get rid of the cavities. We just threw them up into our head uh, as we smushed the nose in. And from primates to apes, uh, apes are primates, and then from apes to humans, we just continually smushed in the face. And all of the apes have this sort of smushed in um, uh, arrangement of our sinus cavities, but humans got the worst end of the deal. And what I mean by this is look at this maxillary cavity right here, the maxillary sinus cavity. This is the drainage hole for this cavity. This cavity will produce tons of mucus, uh, which will drain. And you will notice that the drainage hole, which is called the osteum, is at the top of the chamber. Now, I want to ask you, what plumber would put the drain of a tub or a shower at the top rather than the bottom? Right? So the placement of this drainage pipe uh, for your maxillary sinuses is at the top, not the bottom, where it cannot be aided by gravity. We walk upright, and we have to constantly work against gravity to push the mucus up to the top of this chamber. That's fine and good, and you have cilia that can do this. That's fine and good with its nice, thin, watery uh, mucus. But when you get any kind of infection, any kind of um, viscosity change where the mucus becomes thicker uh, and heavier and denser, then it becomes very hard to do. And, and instead of being able to successfully do this, the mucus begins to pool in this cavity. And that's where you can get um, all the symptoms of an upper respiratory infection, sinus infection in the most serious case, but even just the common cold upper nasal congestion happens because of poor drainage in the sinus cavity. That's the, the key reason that you have this. And um, and, and remember that mucus is actually very rich in calories. It's, it's made of carbohydrates and, and some fats as well and protein, but mostly carbohydrates. Um, and so this is a rich environment for bacteria to set up an infection. And, uh, and, and purely because of evolutionary um, sloppiness, uh, we have this poor drainage. The chimpanzees, the hole is much, much lower and much, much larger. So they have much better um, uh, drainage. Uh, the, the orangutans ditched some of their sinus cavities altogether to be groomed. They just got rid of some of them. Uh, humans really did get the worst end of the deal. And the poor drainage in our sinus cavity is directly responsible for the frequency with which we get upper respiratory infections, the common cold, sinus infections, and so forth. This also explains why you can sometimes get temporary relief by laying down. But just remember, by the time you have symptoms, you already have an infection. So the problem with this is not so much that you it's, it's bad at fighting infections, it's that it allows those infections to, to start in the first place. So most of the time, by the time you actually have symptoms, laying down isn't going to solve them. It can just give you temporary relief. But I encourage you to do that if you, if you can. So this is just one example why 100 million years of evolutionary history has all sort of converged on the common cold uh, in humans. Um, that the poor shape of our sinus cavities due to the regression uh, of, of them up into our face uh, has really caused these problems. Um, but it was a trade-off because the upside is that we have excellent three-dimensional vision. Uh, we have good vision in general, color vision. Our nose is pretty much out of the way. You can only see the nose a little bit uh, in your visual field. Um, we ditched a lot of our olfactory receptors as well. Uh, we really did switch towards a vision-based system. Unfortunately, in the evolution of that, we have um, uh, the Achilles heel of our system here uh, is these cavities that, that really don't drain very well and have really poor anatomical structure. If you were to design the sinus cavities so that they could still produce mucus, which is their job, um, and you would design them much smaller, first of all, but also with much bigger and more logically placed drainage cavities. And if that were the case, a redesign is relatively simple to imagine, uh, but difficult for evolution to do. Um, you could actually, if you were designing it from scratch, have a much better system.
Um, and it's, of course, our, our evolution, our anatomical uh, quirks are not limited to things like our, our sinus cavities. Um, if you just look at the shape of our back, it's a really, it's a really funny structure. So our ancestors, uh, like modern apes, modern day apes, had a J shape uh, to their backbone because they were mostly quadrupedal. They occasionally stand upright for short periods, but mostly quadrupedal. And they have this nice, gentle arch to their back. Well, as we stood upright, we needed to straighten the back. But rather than straighten the upper curve, we actually just added a second curve. So we have an S-shaped back or a sigmoidal-shaped backbone, which creates points of weakness uh, during the sharpest parts of the curve. And the very sharpest parts of the curve, of course, is the lumbar region. And what happens is the discs of cartilage that are in between here, and by the way, there's good reasons why we didn't just straighten it out. All right, I don't mean to say that there was nothing gained there. There was, especially for women. The gynecolog gynecological organs are uh, tethered very much to this curved inward structure. So there are some advantages, but there are disadvantages as well. Uh, and that's what, what a trade-off means. So we have discs of cartilage in between here uh, that sort of lubricate and soften uh, the connections between these bones. But when they're squeezed in an uneven way like that, they can actually get pushed out um, and in, in the direction would be inward uh, because of this, because of the cleavage that, that can happen there. And when this happens, this this nice disc, uh, which which uh, is there to help us, can actually get pushed outwards, and that's called a herniated disc or a slipped disc. Uh, and these are incredibly common in humans, but virtually unheard of in gorillas or chimpanzees or any other ape. This is a purely human problem that is due to really inefficient evolution of an upright walking uh, back. And you have, you have other problems with upright walking uh, in our ankles and in our knees. Probably the most famous example is the ACL, which is found right here. So this ACL, this tiny little ligament, which is called the anterior cruciate ligament, together with behind it, the posterior cruciate ligament. Um, by the way, this is a look at the knee without the kneecap. We've removed uh, the kneecap so that you can see into the joint. Um, well, really, the upper leg and the lower leg are held together by these tiny little ligaments, and they're doing all the work. Unfortunately, evolution didn't make them any bigger or stronger as we started to walk upright. So instead of spreading our weight uh, on four limbs, we spread them just on two. And as our bodies have gotten really a lot bigger over the last 100 to 200 years, uh, this poor ligament is doing far more work than it needs to. And anytime anyone needs to change directions or, or change their momentum very quickly, uh, this poor little ligament is, uh, is vulnerable to snapping. And there's no way to strengthen the ACL through exercise or, or stretching. It, it does not respond the way that tendons do, for example. Um, it is what it is. And uh, when it gets sliced or broken or torn, there's no correction other than surgery. Um, and so the ACL, really, really, our knees are not fully adapted to upright walking. Uh, and, and the reason why we have all of these uh, in our ankles and our knees and our back, why we have all these inefficient adaptations is that in the human lineage, we now know the transition from quadrupedal uh, posture to an upright posture happened very, very quickly. Uh, in less than a million years, probably less than uh, half a million years, that transition was made. And like anything else in life, something you do quickly, you don't do well. Uh, so a very quick adaptation like that is very likely to be sloppy and with lots of little fixes along the way that didn't have time to happen uh, before uh, it was more or less complete. So we have tons of, of inefficiencies uh, throughout our joints that are due to the very rapid evolution of bipedal posture. Okay, so there's lots of other examples in the anatomy chapter. And let's move on a little bit. I want to talk about the genome, which happens to be my area of expertise. Um, our genome is actually littered with problems as well. Most people uh, think of, of, of a genome as being uh, sort of this magical set of information that gives rise to, to all of us. And of course, it is that. It, it's remarkable. We're still learning how the genome can encode something as complex as a human being. But it also does a whole lot of other weird things that are, that are strange and, and unexplainable. Um, so, for example, any of you might not know this, but you have the remnants of genes that used to work and no longer do, and you have tons of them. Um, and in fact, actually, uh, some estimates are that you have almost as many broken down genes as you do functional genes. Uh, and when I say broken down genes, these are the scientific word is pseudo gene. So this is the gene that no longer functions, but did in our ancestral past. So they've been mutated beyond repair. But they're still there, and they're still maintained carefully by proofreading and, and DNA copying. Um, and they are, we refer to them mostly as junk. 
Um, and I mean junk in the literal sense that it's not garbage exactly. Garbage absolutely has no function and never could. Junk can sometimes uh, be restored and you can actually do things with it. But uh, we have almost as much junk um, as functional genes in the human genome. I, I say it's, it's more like a junkyard than a parking lot. Uh, where the cars are, are the official genes. And actually, this is a good analogy, too, because the genes are there, much like a car is there in a junkyard, and you can tell it's a car, you can tell it's a gene, it has many of the features, but it cannot function as a car even a little bit, right? And just like a gene, a, a pseudo gene cannot function as a gene even a little bit, even though most of the parts are there, but some key parts have been mutated. However, you can sometimes uh, capture functions out of them. Uh, but the, the, a famous example of the pseudogene is the one I told you about earlier, where vitamin C, uh, one of the genes in vitamin C synthesis became damaged. And you might wonder, well, why didn't the animal in which this mutation happened just simply die of scurvy and take the gene with it, the, the broken gene with it, and, and, and that's how natural selection is supposed to work? Well, think about where our ancestors lived. They lived in the rainforest of Africa where there's plenty of vitamin C around by chance. They got lucky in that sense, but very unlucky in the sense that now we cannot survive without vitamin C in our diet. So primates um, are, are limited to the kinds of climates that have this. Primates cannot live just anywhere. And in fact, until human ancestors, uh, I'm speaking mostly about Neanderthals, uh, ventured into Europe, Primates had never successfully colonized Europe. It was an entire continent free of primates before humans and our recent ancestors started to migrate there. There are no monkeys that live in, in, in uh, Europe, even though every other continent does have some, um, because vitamin C is just not found very readily then. It is now because of farming, but it wasn't then. Um, there are some exceptions to this more recently, again, because of the way we've transformed. Uh, but it's a fascinating story of how much uh, scurvy really was a problem uh, in all of our primate ancestors because of our inability to make vitamin C. We have other problems in our genome too. There's another a gene that got mutated, unfortunately, in the last 50 million years of ancestry uh, called for something called theta defensin. So this is a protein that we don't have, um, but that other apes do have. Uh, not chimpanzees don't have it either, unfortunately. Um, but there are other primates that have theta defensin, and they have an increasing resistance to retroviruses. Uh, because of this protein that, oh, I wish we had. Because if we did have theta defense in, it's very likely or at least possible that the AIDS epidemic would never have happened because AIDS is caused by HIV, which is a retrovirus. And we have poor defenses against retroviruses because of a pseudogene, uh, a gene that got mutated in our genome called theta defense. There are other examples. Too. We have tens of thousands of broken genes. Many of them are duplicates of other genes, but some are not. Um, so we do have some, some junk in our genome. Also, another fun fact about the genome. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but you have a lot of viral carcasses, uh, as I call them, in your genome. In other words, the remnants of virus infections long ago in our ancestors, where the actual viral genome is still there in our genome. And we don't just have one or two of these. We have so many that it comprises 9% of our DNA. 9% of human DNA is actually viral DNA in origin. Uh, and remember, only about 3% of your DNA codes for genes. So you have three times more viral genes than human genes, is one way to, one way to put that, uh, in your genome. And we copy it around very carefully, and it copies itself some, in some cases. Uh, there's just sort of simply no way to get rid of it. And it doesn't do anything good for us as individuals. Over evolutionary time, it has led to some positive uh, things for the species, for our trajectory. But it has killed countless individuals uh, through, by crashing through important genes in our genome. Uh, humans also have a weird diet. I gave you the example of vitamin C uh, necessity, but we have a very needy diet in general. Think about how simple most animal diets are. Uh, even your dogs and your cat, their dog food is very simple, very few ingredients, and they can, they can live a very happy life. If you tried to survive just on dog food, for example, you would die of, of dietary uh, insufficiencies, vitamin uh, deficiencies in, in, in uh, years, if not months. Um, think of the koala bear living exclusively on eucalyptus leaves. Uh, most animals have a very simple diet, or at least can live on a very simple diet, but we cannot. We have a very needy, demanding diet. You need a little bit of this, a little bit of that, not too much of this. Think of how many things are on our nutrient list uh, that we need to get enough of, vitamins and minerals and things. And some of these we share with other animals, but a lot of them we don't. We have a lot, a lot of unique needs. Um, and and um, I, I gave you the example of scurvy, and, and scurvy is a terrible illness. Vitamin C is required uh, for collagen synthesis. That's the main, main reason we need vitamin C. 
And collagen is responsible for the extracellular matrix throughout our body. Almost every tissue in your body is held together by collagen. Um, and so when you don't have vitamin C and you don't make collagen, your tissue literally just starts to fall apart, starts to liquefy. Um, and, and individuals with scurvy, their, their teeth will, will fall out of their head, um, bleed out of their eyes and other orifices. Um, it's really just you lose tissue integrity throughout the body. Um, vitamin B12 is another really weird one that we have this, this demand for. Um, it, those of you who are vegans uh, are probably aware of, of the dietary need for vitamin B12. If you have meat or other animal products in your diet, vitamin, getting enough vitamin B12 is usually not a problem. But if you are a vegan, you have to worry about it. Uh, the strange thing about vitamin B12 is you might wonder, well, how do all the herbivore animals get it? I mean, if, if humans need it from animal products, the vast majority of animals are herbivores. In fact, the animals we eat are herbivores, right? So pigs and uh, cows, uh, they, they, they all, uh, none of them eat meat. So how are they getting vitamin B12? Well, it turns out they have bacteria in their large intestine that make vitamin B12 for them as a side product. And then they absorb the B12 right there in their large intestine. Uh, uh, and they get, they, they get it that way for free uh, from, the, from the bacteria that live there. We were like, well, that's no fair. Why can't we get that bacteria? Why can't we have that in our guts? And that way we don't need to eat meat uh, or, or animal, pro animal products. Well, it turns out we do have the bacteria, the same bacteria, and they do make vitamin B12. Why can't we just absorb it right then and there? Why do we need it in our diet? Well, it turns out that the bacteria that make vitamin B12 for us are in our large intestine, but we can only absorb vitamin B12 in our small intestine. So it's the wrong place. So this bacteria go to all the trouble to make vitamin B12 for us. And then we send that vitamin B12 to the toilet rather than absorbing it uh, as we could. Um, and so we have to ingest vitamin B12 simply because we don't absorb it in the right place. What a curiosity. Other animals don't have that. If they're herbivores uh, versus being carnivores, it's matched where they absorb it in the right place. And you might say, well, how did, how did this come to pass? Well, again, humans transitioned from vegetarian ancestors to omnivorous ancestors very, very quickly, and they just simply didn't get it right. So the ability to eat vitamin uh, meat became a necessity to eat meat uh, because of this mismatch. And just in case if your mind is going there, uh, is human excrement a dietarily sufficient source of vitamin B12? The answer is yes. If you were really absolutely running out of B, uh, vitamin B12, you, you do have a ready source that you can make yourself. But for lots of reasons, I don't recommend that you do so. Um, we also have quirky needs for vitamin D. Uh, we need to make sure we get enough vitamin D or else we won't absorb calcium. Uh, so we have one requirement in order to have another requirement. Both calcium and vitamin D are needed. And if you don't get those when you're growing, uh, it leads to a condition called rickets. If you don't get it when you're older, it leads to a condition called osteoporosis. Either way, weak, brittle bones result if you don't get enough vitamin D. And our natural diet... Um, uh, as ancestors had plenty of it. And then we migrated away uh, into other environments and we lose our ability to make vitamin D uh, ourselves. And vitamin D is a weird one. We need a little bit of sunlight, right? That's a, you might know that, that vitamin D has, a, there's an activation step that must take place in our skin uh, in order to, to have fully active vitamin D. The vitamin D that you take in your environment is not it needs the sunlight, it needs the activation step in your liver and in your kidney. There are three activation steps for vitamin D that happen in three different tissues. Um, so all of this creates a chance for insufficiency, which is why rickets and osteoporosis are global problems still to this day. Um, and not getting enough sunlight can lead to this problem no matter how much vitamin D you eat, which is why a lot of us become deficient in the winter months. Why? Because we put clothes on. Why do we put clothes on? Because we lost our hair, right? Um, all the other mammals, they don't have this problem because they activate vitamin D in their fur, not in their skin, in their fur. We ditched our fur, so we only have our skin. We migrated out of the warm climate of Africa, we put on clothes, and therefore gave ourselves rickets and osteoporosis. So it's a common uh, push-pull trade-off. This, this, this is a common theme in evolutionary biology, that one gain is another loss. Um, and, and our diet is just one example of this. Um, and I need to keep moving on here or I'm going to run out of time. Um, we have inefficiencies in our reproduction. Um, I mean, many of us know someone who has had fertility problems. And you would think if there's one thing a species should be able to do with success, it's reproduce. But actually, humans are one of the least fertile species there are. I know that sounds very strange for a species that has since completely filled up the planet every everywhere we go. Uh, but, but keep in mind how recent that is. The human, our, our species was teetering on the brink of extinction multiple times in our past. 
Um, and think about all of the other hominins that have gone extinct, which were the most intelligent things that lived up until that point, and they still went extinct. Uh, all of our closest relatives have gone extinct, um, from Neanderthals to Denisovans to Homo erectus, Homo habilis, all of the, the uh, Homo naledi. If you can, you can name all kinds of uh, recent human relatives that have all gone extinct, and at least part of why they did is our inefficiencies with reproduction. Uh, and we have inefficiencies throughout the entire reproductive process, from how, how long it takes us to reach maturity, to creation of gametes, to have frequency of miscarriages and chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, we are a very infertile species. In fact, um, far more conception events, even when we can get sperm and egg um, uh, to unite and, and create a zygote, more than half of those, even if everything else goes right, more than half of those simply bounce off the uterine wall and don't, don't result in a pregnancy. And then once you get a pregnancy, a great large number of those uh, don't finish the first trimester successfully. We are incredibly uh, infertile species uh, in the grand scheme of things. Even if you get past all of that, uh, the biggest danger, uh, of course, remains, uh, and that is childbirth. We have unique problems with childbirth. Um, I mean, I want you to think about uh, most farm animals, um, you know, or any animals out there, uh, other mammals. Childbirth is really not that much of a struggle, and it's certainly not as much of a medical problem as it is. I mean, you can you can uh, find videos on YouTube of, of gorillas giving birth, and they're you know eating and caring for other children at the same time. It, it really doesn't even look like a dramatic affair. Uh, a lot of a lot of animals, uh, a lot of mammals give give birth without without too much trouble. But as you know, with humans, it's an extremely fraught fraught time. Um, and until modern medicine, it was it was one of the most common ways that individuals died was either by being born or by giving birth. Either way, it was dangerous to both parties. And part of why this is, there's a number of reasons why, but part of why this is is the anatomy of our skull, the big brain that we have, and the anatomy of our pelvis are not very well matched. Here's why. Millions of years ago, long before we got our big brains, humans developed the upright posture. And we think of our knees and our back, but there's also changes in our hip. Uh, what happens in order to have a nice, even way of walking upright is you need to bring the legs down, so closer together in, in the front, um, I mean, at the top of the legs, and have them really come together so that their legs are nice and neat in this what we call a striding gait, where your center of gravity does not bounce back and forth very much because the legs are very, very close together, right? You want to narrow the bottom of the pelvis and have the legs come straight down. If you've ever seen a chimpanzee walk on two legs, you can get, you can see how different our walking is because they kind of bounce back and forth and they swing their legs around a little bit uh, because they don't have uh, that nice narrow pelvis at the bottom. That happened first, and our big brain happened two million years later. Then you have the expansion of the brain, and basically something has to give. A narrow pelvis and a big brain are in tension. So if you, if you look at a chimpanzee pelvis, uh, this is an adult female chimpanzee pelvis drawn to scale with a chimpanzee skull at birth, and you can see that there's really no problem uh, getting through the birth canal. Um, uh, given, given the shape of their pelvis. But if you look at after we started upright walking and our brain began to, to uh, grow, you can see the pelvis shape of one of our sort of mid-range ancestors. This is a bipedal ancestor called Australopithecus afarensis. You may have heard of Lucy, the Lucy skeleton. This is that species. If you look at the birth canal and the head at birth, um, you'll notice the head is not that much bigger, but the birth canal has narrowed. Uh, and you have quite a tight squeeze in this species, but probably... Not so bad. But if you look at an adult human female pelvis in an adult or in a child cranium at birth, when you draw these to scale, many of you are now crossing your legs now and, and thinking, well, that doesn't fit. And uh, that's exactly right. We actually have to flex uh, the pelvis here. It's incompletely fused in females to allow this head to get through. Um, and basically, humans are born as late as they possibly can. Uh, the compromise. I mean, think about the compromise that has to be made here. Walking upright is good, but big brains are good. And so you have a tug of war. You're pulling on both ends of the rope. And the compromise that evolution came, came up with is that humans are born too early. We just sort of push them out as early as we can before the brain gets any bigger. And because of that, um, child, death and childbirth is very common. And, hum, and human infants are born very incapable. Think about you know, horses and, and, and cows. They're born, they sort of stand up, shake themselves off, and are off and running on the same day. Whereas human infants are completely incapable, can't do anything for themselves. And really, as a species, we can't do anything for ourselves for about 35 years of life. Um, 
exaggerating a little bit here, but sometimes it feels that way. Um, the, the point being is that that the big brains came at enormous cost, and part of that cost was in our fertility and the dangers of childbirth. Um, and I'm going to have to stop now because I do want time for questions. I had another couple of examples I was going to give you, uh, but some of those were resulted to diseases that we are actually evolved to have. These are not just bad luck. These are accident, and, and they're not just accidents. We're evolved to have certain diseases. Things like lupus, sickle cell anemia are actually the result of an evolutionary process, not an accident. Um, and we have, and this is the slide about that. We also have uh, diseases of our mind, as you're called cognitive biases, where we have certain errors that our minds make over and over and over again. Uh, not just because it has limits, everything has limits, but we actually are, are programmed to think about things in an incorrect way. That made very, very good sense when we were living in the African savanna, but now in the modern world, some of these errors in our mind lead us to uh, really, really terrible decision-making, uh, both on an individual basis and on a global scale in, in populations and societies. And part of the reasons that we kill each other in such large numbers uh, are the results of some adaptations that we have in our brain that make it easy for us to do that. Um, and I talk about that in my book. That's not the most uplifting chapter, I will say. Uh, but the take home point of the book uh, is that we are so flawed, we have all of these limitations, but why is that? The reason why is that humans built an interactive society where we have division of labor and incredible social interactions that took the pressure off of each one of us to do it all. That took the pressure off of each one of us to be perfect in any way. If your eyes are no good, maybe you can't be a hunter, but you do something else. You work with your hands. If your hands are no good, maybe you're good at raising children. If not, if your body is terrible in general, maybe you're really smart and you have the good ideas. You could be a shaman. You could be a leader. There were many different ways for you to contribute. And what that meant is your body didn't have to be perfect. If you were born with bad knees, you didn't die. You just did something else. So our incredible, intricate social structure, us caring for each other, is why we, our bodies are so bad, because natural selection took its scrutiny off of our bodies and put it more on our social structure. We're evolved to care for one another so that we don't have to be perfect. And I don't know about you, I'm pretty glad that I don't have to be perfect and that I can rely on others to do things for me. Um, right? I, I don't have to be good at everything. I just have to find some way to contribute and have value to the group. Um, and so it is an uplifting message in the end. Um, and and uh, humans have unique adaptations for our, our social structure. All animals learn, but we're the only species that teaches. Um, and that's a big difference. So um, rather than lead into the award ceremony, I think I'll stop now and we might have time for a couple of questions. I hope, I hope we do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lentz, for that exceptionally fascinating talk. As expected, we do have some questions from our audience. Our first question is, what do you think the most important adaptations humans have made are? Well, um, it depends on, on what you find most important. So I think our social structure and ad the adaptations required for our social structure are the most important. Our ability to work with each other and rely on one another and have an intricate uh, social structure is our best adaptation. And this, of course, happened in the brain. With the expansion of the brain, we can maintain different kinds of social relationships and our, the size of our social group can swell. Within primates, there's a really good relationship between the size of the brain and the size of the group that the species lives in. The bigger the group, the bigger the brain, because it takes a lot of brain power to maintain all these relationships. Think about the relationship you have with your parents, your siblings, your friends, your teachers, your employers, your employees, um, your mailman. You have a separate, different kind of relationship with so many different humans. And there are other species that have that. There's a, one or two kinds of relationships, but we have literally every relationship is unique. And to keep track of all that takes a big brain. But that's also what's allowed us to do all the great things that we do. Um, every animal besides humans pretty much learns what they learn and then the, the knowledge dies with them. And every generation has to relearn the same things. But we, because of our social structure, each generation adds to the repository of cultural knowledge. It's one large cumulative pot of knowledge and each generation just adds on to the one that came before it. So we're not starting from scratch. Each time a uh, new generation is born, we all just get to add. So I think that's our our, our defining feature, but also our, our greatest feature. If we don't misuse it and in, in, uh, in, in, in take over the planet, 
uh, with our ways and, and, and at great cost to others. Thank you. One final question. What do you think about the relationship between adaptation and climate change? Well, that's a great that's a great topic, and I, I do talk a little bit about in the book because the reason why we're facing some of the problems like climate change are because some of the poor adaptations of our mind. Evolution has never rewarded a species for thinking far ahead, for thinking more than one generation ahead. Evolution is about making gains right now. Long-term thinking is just not that that's an evolution's blind spot. So that's why each generation is really poor at thinking beyond their own time. Uh, we're just not a species that's designed to do that. And so the problems of climate change, for example, um, it's not a scientific problem. All the technology to make us energy independent, to make us sustainably, um, without even making large sacrifices, all of the technology is there. What we don't have is the will to transition because there will be some organizations that don't make as much money when we make that transition and those organizations have are using all of their power to prevent us from making that transition but we all know that we, something has to change eventually and that it will come at great cost the longer we wait um, but because short-term gains are how we're always programmed to think short-term value short-term gain short-term profit uh, drives all of our decision making so we can until we can break out of that um, Basically, we don't know yet if our big brains are our biggest advantage or our biggest liability, because it might very well be that our ingenuity is what is our downfall as a species rather than our escape. We'll have to see. But we can't blame the science, because even every problem that science created, science can solve. What we need is the will to solve it. Um, and I hope that we do, for all of you young people's sake, because you're going to suffer more than I will. <laughs> Always so much to think about. Thank you once again, Dr. Lentz, for that engaging and informative talk. Now, we turn to our Central New York Science and Engineering Fair participants. You wondered, you worked, you researched, you rehearsed, you won. You are all winners. Let us now begin our Central New York Science and Engineering Fair Awards Ceremony. Let's start off by thanking our sponsors with a special thanks to our presenting sponsor, SRC. Central New York Science and Engineering Fair Award medallions will be received by 60% of the participants. Three levels of CNYSEF awards are given based upon the following criteria and at the direction of the judges. Honors. The participant shows an above average understanding of a scientific or engineering principle. High honors. The participant shows an above average effort in understanding a scientific or engineering principle. The oral presentation, exhibit, and written report show well above average effort, attention to detail, and level of interest. Highest honors. The participant shows a clear, in-depth understanding of a scientific or engineering principle. The oral presentation, exhibit, and written report show superior effort, attention to detail, and level of interest. Junior Division. This year's fourth grade honors recipient is John Forbes for the project Stain Remover. This year's fourth grade high honors recipient is Rosalie Dendalenko for Lipstick Madness. 
This year's fourth grade highest honors winner is Eleanor Vitali for Invisible Ink. This year's fifth grade honors recipients are recipients are Emily Truong and Ava Ricci for their project Pincushion Cactus. This year's fifth grade high honors recipient is Kiara Baker for her project entitled Which Soda is Worse for Your Teeth? This year's fifth grade highest honors recipient is Lucy Gallery for her project entitled Mask Force One. This year's sixth grade honors recipient is Yusuf I for the project entitled Measuring Rates of photosynthesis. The sixth grade high honors recipient is Layla Dougal for the project entitled Decoding Fibonacci. The sixth grade highest honors recipient, recipients are Rebecca Taffy Harris and Srinithi Giela for the project entitled Hydro Cleanser. The seventh grade highest honors recipient is Mania Kokar for the project entitled Potential Prevention Strategy and Treatments for COVID-19. Eighth grade. The recipients of this year's eighth grade honors awards are Intisar Haddad for the project entitled Convert to Kinetic and Amatiz Fazeli for the project entitled Water Purification. Eighth grade high honors. The award goes to Genevieve McGuire Griffin for the project entitled A Butterfly Journal. Eighth grade highest honors. This award goes to Alexa Rose Battaglia for the project entitled Combating Crown Gall, Prevention of Cancer in Plants. Outstanding job, all junior division participants. We now move forward with the Regional Merit Awards. Regional Merit Awards are provided by Central New York organizations, colleges, universities, and STEM corporations. The Alpha Chi Sigma Award in Chemistry recognizes outstanding accomplishments in fundamental or applied chemical science. The recipient is awarded a medallion and the book Elements, A Visual Exploration. Our 2021 winner is Yusuf I from Eagle Middle School for the project entitled Measuring Rates of Photosynthesis. The Central New York section of the American Chemical Society Award in Chemistry recognizes excellence in the understanding or implementation of chemistry principles. Our 2021 winner is Eleanor Vitali from Huntington School for the project entitled Invisible Ink with Common Household Items.
the Earth Science Department, Syracuse University Geology Award, recognizes excellence in earth science research and is open to all participants. Winners receive a certificate and $200. Our 2021 winner is Amatiz Fizelli from Man Manlius Pebble Hill School for the project entitled Water Purification. Congratulations. The Energy 21 Symposium Award selects and sponsors a senior level project to attend the 17th Annual Symposium on Energy in the 21st Century. This year's winner is Taha Hayali of Syracuse Academy of Science for the project entitled The Eco-Friendly Connection Between Urban and City Center. Congratulations. The IEEE Award Awards in Electrical and Computer Engineering recognize students showing mastery in the area of electricity and magnetism, electronics, computer science, or optics. Our 2021 winners are Matthew Roberson, Layla Dougal, Elise Eng, Yakina Sika Emma, Theodore Simon, and Kiva Dudgeon. Congratulations. The Lemoyne Excellence in Mathematics or Computer Science Award recognizes both junior and senior projects demonstrating excellence in these fields. Recipients receive a $100 gift certificate for junior division and one $200 gift certificate for senior division. This year's junior winner is Layla Dougal for the project entitled Decoding Fibonacci. Our senior winner this year as Kiva Dudgeon for the project entitled Oscar Tracking Wearable Computer System. Congratulations to both of you. The Lockheed Martin Awards recognize excellence in engineering and technology. Recipients receive gift bags awarded to both junior and senior projects. Our 2021 Lockheed Martin Award winners are Angelina Allen, Ethan Brown, Liam Sprague, Intisar Haddad, Elise Eng, Matthew Roberson, Jacob Arteski, Jared Dougal, Gehrig Snyder, Darian Tompkins, Layla Dougal, Kiva Dudgeon, and Yusuf I. Congratulations. The SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry Best Environmental Science Project recognizes achievement in environmental science project. This year's single recipient will receive a $50 gift certificate. Our 2021 winner is Matthew Roberson from Manlius Pebble Hill School for the project entitled Utilizing a Photographic Method for Measuring Sky Glow. Congratulations. The SUNY Cortland Chemistry Award recognizes excellence in chemistry research. This year's winner is Amatiz Fazeli from Manlius Pebble Hill School for the project entitled Water Purification. Congratulations. The Cigna Goulash Mathematics Award recognizes a project demonstrating excellence in mathematics. The recipient will receive a certificate and $250 for a female student in either the junior or senior division. This year's winner 
as Layla Dougal from Eagle Hill Middle School for the project Decoding Fibonacci. Congratulations. The Terra Science and Education Award is given to 10 outstanding STEM projects. This award will be given to five projects from the junior level and five from the senior level. The recipients will receive a certificate and $25 gift cards for each project. Our 2021 winners are Rebecca Taffy Harris and Srinithi Gil Gilella, Feriel Magid, Yusuf I, Mania Kokar, and Alexa Rose Battaglia. And those were our junior division winners. Our senior division winners for the Terra Science Award are Savan Kodali and Samuel Lustig, Jacob Arteski, Gehrig Snyder and Darian Tompkins, Kiva Dudgeon, Yakina Sika Amoa, and Theodore Simon. Congratulations. We now continue on to present our Regeneron ISAF Awards. The Regeneron ISAF International Science and Engineering Fair Awards are provided by the International Science and Engineering Fair, of which the Central New York Regional Fair is an affiliate. The American Psychological Association Award recognizes outstanding research in psychology junior or senior division under the category of behavioral and social sciences. There is no team award available. The recipient receives a certificate. This year's winner is Jared Dougal from Fayetteville Manlius Senior High School for the project entitled Patching Remote File Inclusion and Cross-Site Scripting on Public and Private Websites. Congratulations. The ASM Materials Education Foundation is for the best materials engineering project. This year's winner, winners are Rebecca Taffy Harris and Srinithi Galella from Wellwood Middle School for the project Hydro Cleanser. Congratulations. The Association for Women Geoscientists Award recognizes projects by female students that exemplify high standards of innovativeness and scientific excellence in the geosciences. This year's winners are Rebecca Taffy Harris and Srinithi Gilella from Wellwood Middle School for the project entitled Hydro Cleanser. The Lemelson Foundation Award celebrates outstanding inventors and inspires young people to pursue inventive careers by increasing opportunities for middle school students. The winning project was recognized because it exemplifies the ideals of innovative thinking by addressing a challenge you see in your community and creating a solution that will improve the lives of others. This award is for 6th through 8th grade projects only. Our 2021 winner is Manya Kukar from Vestal Middle School for the project entitled Improvement of Gut Microbiome by Reducing Consumption of Processed Food and Simulation of Bat Microbiome, Potential Prevention Strategy and Treatments for COVID-19. Congratulations.
the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Award recognizes research that emphasizes NOAA's mission to understand and predict changes in Earth's environment and to conserve and manage coastal and marine resources to meet our nation's economic, social, and environmental needs. Our 2021 winner is Amatiz Fazeli from Manlius Pebble Hill School for the project entitled Water Purification. Congratulations. The Office of Naval, Na Naval Research Naval Science Award recognizes individual meritorious STEM projects. Our junior division winners are Fariel Magid, Rosalie Jendalenko, Lucy Gallery, and Layla Dougal. Congratulations. Our 2021 senior recipients are Kiva Dudgeon, Jaden Dougal, and Ayabek Iskenderov. Congratulations. The RICO Sustainable Development Award recognizes a student whose research has demonstrated the principles and technical innovations that offer the greatest potential for sustainable development. Our 2021 winner, winners are Yakina Sika Emeoa and Theodore Simon from Syracuse Academy Science Charter School for the project entitled Developing a Robot for Cleaning Coastlines. Congratulations. The Society for In Vitro Biology Award is given to the most outstanding 11th grade student exhibiting in the areas of plant or animal in vitro biology or tissue culture. This is an individual award and this year's recipients are Gehrig Snyder and Darian Tompkins from Christian Brothers Academy for the project entitled The Effect of Hypomagnetic Environments on Planarians. The Stockholm Junior Water Prize recognizes senior projects related to water quality, water resource management, water protection, water treatment, or waste water treatment. This year's winners are Yakina Sika Emoa and Theodore Simon from Syracuse Academy of Science Charter Schools for the project entitled Developing a Robot for Cleaning Coastlines. Congratulations. The U.S. Agency for International Development Award recognizes an exceptional individual or team project that has the potential to make an impact on addressing international development challenges. This year's winners are Yakina Sika Amoa and Theodore Simon from Syracuse Academy of Science Charter School for their project entitled Developing a Robot for Cleaning Coastlines. Congratulations. The U.S. Metric Association Award recognizes a student whose project involves a significant amount of quantitative measurement and which best uses the SI metric system for those measurements. This year's winner is Elise Eng from Manlius Pebble Hill School for her project entitled, What's Your Frequency? RF Radiation Levels in Cell Phones and Headphones. Congratulations. The Yale Science and Engineering Association Award recognizes the most outstanding 11th grade student exhibiting in the areas of computer science, engineering, physics, or chemistry. This year's winner is Matthew Roberson from Manlius Pebble Hill School for the project entitled Utilizing a Photographic Method 
for measuring sky glow. Congratulations. It's time to award our senior level medallion winners. Highest honors are awarded to the top 10%. High honors are awarded to the next 20%. And honors are awarded to the next 30%. Senior level students encompass grades 9 through 12. This year's honors level medallion recipients are Jacob Artiski, Elise Eng, Matthew Roberson, and Gary Snyder and Darian Tompkins. Congratulations. This year's High Honors Medallion winners are Kiva Dudgeon, Jaden Duggal, and Yakina Sika Emoa and Theodore Simon. Congratulations. And our 2021 Senior Level Highest Honors recipients are Sarvan Kodali, and Samuel Lustig. Congratulations. Turning now to our local scholarship awards. Our local scholarships are provided by Central New York colleges, universities, and related organizations. The Casanova College Scholarship recognizes two 11th grade students for excellence in research in the field of biology or environmental biology with $12,500 per year tuition assistance for four years. The 2021 winners are Garrig Snyder and Darian Tompkins from Christian Brothers Academy for the project entitled The Effect of Hypomagnetic Environments on Planarians. Congratulations. The SUNY Cortland Science Leadership Scholarship recognizes a senior level participant for outstanding leadership, research, and accomplishments in the field of science with $3,300 per year tuition assistance for four years. This year's winner is Honor Shalal of Syracuse Academy of Science for the project entitled Five Second Rule. Congratulations. The SUNY ESF Scholarship recognizes a senior level participant for outstanding accomplishments in the field of environmental science with $1,000 per year tuition assistance for four years. Our 2021 recipient is Matthew Roberson of Manlius Pebble Hill School for the project entitled, Utilizing a Photographic Method for Measuring Sky Glow. Congratulations. The Syracuse Pulp and Paper Foundation at SUNY ESF Scholarship recognizes a participant for outstanding accomplishments in the field of paper engineering with $500 per semester tuition assistance for four years. This year's award recipient is Angelina Allen from Camillus Middle School for the project entitled Pyro Paper. Congratulations. The Upstate Dean's Award in the Biological Sciences recognizes a senior level participant whose project demonstrates creativity, innovation, and scientific excellence 
and the Biological Sciences with a $500 award. This year's winners are Sarvan Kodali and Samuel Lustig from Christian Brothers Academy for the project entitled, A Novel Efflux Pump Inhibitor Improves Chemotherapeutic Efficacy Against P. Glycoprotein Expressing Glioblastoma Cells. Congratulations. And finally, we've come to the grand prize segment of our awards ceremony. The grand prizes are awarded to projects that will advance further to state, national, and international fairs. Up to three junior level projects will be nominated for the Broadcom Masters Award. Broadcom Masters, Math, Applied Science, Technology, and Engineering for Rising Stars is intended to encourage, reward, and celebrate the mastery of science, technology, engineering, and math among sixth, seventh, and eighth grade science fair participants. These three are the top 6th, 7th, and 8th grade projects. Our 2021 Broadcom Masters Award recipients are Alexa Rose Battaglia, Mania Kokar, and Rebecca Taffy Harris, and Srinithi Gilella. Congratulations. Up to three senior and three junior level projects will be chosen to attend the New York State Science Congress on Saturday, June 12th, 2021, hosted by the most right here in Syracuse. The central section of the Science Teachers Association of New York and the most provides $200 for registration and travel stipend per student. This year's winners are Amatiz Fazeli, Manea Kokar, Genevieve McGuire Griffin, Jaden Dougal, Kiva Dudgeon, Gehrig Snyder, and Darian Tompkins. Congratulations, New York State Science Congress winners. And finally, our top award given at the Central New York Science and Engineering Fair. The two top senior level projects will be chosen to attend the virtual Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair, May 16th through 21st, 2021. Judging will take place May 3rd through 6th. Registration costs will be covered by the Milton J. Rubenstein Museum of Science and Technology. Our 2021 ISEF winners are Sarvan Kodali and Samuel Lustig from Christian Brothers Academy for the project entitled, A Novel Efflux Pump Inhibitor Improves Chemotherapeutic Efficacy against P. glycoprotein expressing glyboblastoma cells. And our other set of recipients are Yakina Sika Amayoa and Theodore Simon from Syracuse Academy of Science for their project entitled Developing a Robot for Cleaning Coastlines. Congratulations. And that concludes today's program. Congratulations to all. Thank you for participating. You are all winners. I look forward to seeing all of you in person once again next year. Take good care.